Well, welcome. We're going to be looking at a disturbing subject. The title of these two sessions is called The Death of Discernment. The Age of Apostasy is the aspect we're going to look at. In this session, we're going to look at the Age of Apostasy. In our next session, we will look at the antidote for apostasy. So whatever you do, don't leave this session uh, in any state of depression. There is an answer and response to what we will be looking at in session one. When we consider signs of the end times, let me ask you a question. Which end times theme is mentioned most in the Bible? Certainly, if you were to go to a a Bible bookstore that had books on prophecy, you might come away with the idea that the Bible primarily speaks of global disasters. That primarily because of the references made by Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 24. Some might say the most often referenced um, end times theme that we should be looking for is the rise of the global super state. Some might Say it's the identity of the Antichrist, this ominous character that appears in the end times. Or even more specifically, the mark of the beast. Some might refer to what is called the Magog invasion, that which is recorded in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, which is on, I believe, our near-term prophetic future. But there's another theme that is often overlooked And it is the theme in the end times concerning deception and apostasy. Now, when we consider apostasy as a sign of the end times, we merely need to go to Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 11, where Jesus is meeting with his disciples for a confidential briefing there on the Mount of Olives. And there, Matthew records Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We see the Apostle Peter warning Timothy in his final epistle to Timothy. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And then, of course, Paul also writes to uh, the Thessalonican church, to Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so there we have the whole end time scenario going right up to the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, but notice the thing that precedes all of that. It's the falling away, the Greek Word is where we get our English word apostasy takes place first. And so that is an indication, a precursor to the end times events. Now, in all three of these references, we see an indication that there will be a falling away. Jesus recorded in Luke's gospel says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? That's a rhetorical device that Jesus uses for which the only correct answer is little or none. One might even ask at this point, so are we now in the age of apostasy? Well, let's look at some indicators of decline. Church attended in England, for example, as a percentage of the population in 1970 was 13.3%. Now, it's important that you recognize that uh, these are official statistics um, uh, from the British government, uh, and this number includes both Protestant and Catholic. In 1980, the 1980 census showed that 11.1% of the nation considered themselves as Christian. 1990, it was 9.4 attended a church. 2007.2% 
And in 2010, 5.3% of a nation of some 60 million people attend church. And that includes both Protestant and Catholic. So you can see there'll be even a, a smaller portion of that number which are Protestants. Another disturbing trend is to not only see that there is a decline uh, in the population of the churches in England, but that the average age is increasing. So that in 2010, the average age was 50 years old. What that shows us is that as the population declines, it is primarily the young people that are vacating the church. The older people are remaining to keep the numbers up to a degree, but the decline is primarily among young people within the church. There are also disturbing indications of decline in the area of biblical literacy. April 13, 2001, prior to Easter in the Portsmouth News, I used to live in Portsmouth, England, in the Portsmouth News, the editor there asked 50 members of the church clergy about their congregation's beliefs. So they weren't asking what they believed. They were simply asking what their congregations believed. They reported that 48% of their congregations did not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus, and that 60% of them believed that the spirit of Easter had been lost in favor of bunnies and Easter eggs. Now, when you consider the fact that at that time, 7.2% of the people in England were attending church, 60% of them in the Portsmouth area believed that the spirit of Easter had been lost in favor of bunnies and Easter eggs, and 48, almost 50% of them, did not even believe in the physical resurrection. And so you have an amazingly disappointing statistic about biblical literacy within the churches in England. Now, as we examine this decline, not only in England, but worldwide, we'll look for the causes of this decline. And we will look at three primary causes. And each of these three primary causes have an historic precedent in the nation of Israel, in their history. We do so because Romans chapter 15 verse 4 tells us we should do so. There we read, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so the benefit at one level of reading through the entirety of Scripture, there are many reasons why that is a benefit, but one of the benefits is we can learn from the mistakes and misdeeds of others. So as we examine the nation of Israel, at the critical points of that nation, we see what were the indicators of spiritual decline so that we can apply that to our understanding of what is going on in the church today and how to respond to it. We take a look at Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Jeremiah was the prophet that presided over the nation of Judah. In fact, he was the final prophet over the independent state of Judah prior to them being carried away into captivity by the Babylonians. Beginning in verse 11, he writes, Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. And so here you have this amazingly powerful word picture. The idea that water being an essential to quench thirst was something that needed to be acquired on a daily basis. And so positioning yourself near a well or a, or a spring was advantageous. And of course, that which is a continual flowing spring will be the cleanest and sweetest of waters. 
And so God equates the truth that he was giving the nation of Israel and his leadership and guidance as though it was the fountain of living water, constantly and forever flowing for them to satisfy their thirst. But notice how he characterizes the actions of the people of Israel. They've forsaken the fountain of living waters and hewn for themselves cisterns. Now, these were holes in the ground that would collect rainwater. And oftentimes they would go into these large uh, man-made caverns and they would try to plaster them uh, so that as the rain was collected, uh, the water would remain. And of course, if you know much about uh, uh, stagnant water over time, uh, it becomes putrid. Uh, the microorganisms uh, make the water uh, first brackish and then eventually unhealthful. Uh, and, and so he equates the effort of the nation of Israel as forsaking that which is God provided and going after that which is man provided. The living waters that burst forth from the fountain of God or these broken cisterns. Notice there's one fountain and many cisterns. And they've forsaken the, the fountain of living waters and they have embraced these broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now what about us today? Are there broken cisterns that are being embraced by the church today? Well, one, for example, is Darwinian physical science. Now, this is a familiar character. Darwin lived in the 19th century, wrote his famous book on the origin of a species. And, of course, Darwin gave modern science really a type of science which provides declaration over exploration. What I mean is he made some observations made a declaration, but did not, in subsequent investigations, clarify, nor really test it scientifically. And of course, we see that in the scientific world today. If you go against the theory of uh, evolution in any way, shape, or form, or provide test evidence that would contradict this theory of Darwin, of course, you're, you're summarily marched out of the scientific ranks and branded some kind of religious nutcase. And so really it, it, it's become more of a religion uh, than pure science anymore. But it gave the world the sense that they make a declaration and then they will not examine anything that would unseat that position. What is the result of this ultimately in the world and its impact upon the church. And that is, it is the killing of God the creator. You see, I don't need divine intervention if I have a naturalistic mechanism by which um, nothing can become everything. You know, they say of the Big Bang Theory that in the beginning there was nothing, it exploded and became everything. There are so many problems with the evolutionary model not only within the idea that non-life can become life, which violates the law of biogenesis, which is sacred within the world of biology. You know that if you sterilize something and contain it in a sterile environment, life cannot exist. It cannot come from non-life. And yet that is the basis uh, of, of where all life began and then began through fortunate mistakes mutating to the immense complexity and balance within the world today. And so we have this sense of the, the, uh, the killing of God and sadly, many within the church are promoting this idea of theistic evolution feeling that they want to be accepted by the world, not seen as some sort of religious bigots, and so they somehow try to force fit the concept of God using millions and billions of years to bring about through accidental circumstances the complexity that we see before us today. It's a fool's errand to do so, in my opinion. The second broken cistern embraced and has infiltrated the church is Freudian mental science. 
Again, Sigmund Freud lived in the late 19th into the early 20th century. And he basically, as a atheist, gave the world escape from sin. What I mean by that is by declaring everyone to be a victim of their upbringing, he no longer requires the sense of personal accountability. And therefore, we see the impact upon individuals and the church in general as killing God the judge. So evolution kills God the creator. Uh, Secular psychology kills God the judge. And sadly, the church is one of the primary promoters of secular psychology, constantly trying to uh, somehow integrate, uh, just like with theistic evolution, trying to integrate popular uh, secular psychology uh, into um, what the scriptures could, would say concerning the soul. The third that has infiltrated and influenced the church really came out of the late 19th into the 20th century, referred to as um, biblical higher criticism. This idea uh, that truth is something that can be established by committee and through the intellect of man. What it gave the world and also the church is that of spiritual self-doubt. The result of it is really giving everyone a sense of the absence of personal discernment. In other words, we really can't know anything for sure, so therefore we really can't understand what is true. And sadly, those within the church that promote this idea of biblical higher criticism promotes their own self-criticism and erodes the confidence that individuals would otherwise have in the Bible. So we've examined the first cause, which is that of broken cisterns. We will now look at the second cause, which we have a precedent within the nation of Israel, which I refer to as alliances of weakness. If we look at Hosea chapter 7, beginning in verse 8, we read, Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Aliens have devoured his strength. But he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. Now, as we look at this, we need to first understand that Hosea was a prophet that presided over a time in the nation of northern Israel. This is after the division of the northern and southern tribes into two separate nations. Hosea is presiding at a time when there was great physical prosperity, and yet there was great spiritual apostasy. He says to them, Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. The word Ephraim means doubly fruitful. And surely, economically, within society, they were doubly fruitful. Yet his complaint to them is they have mixed themselves among the peoples. Now, what is he referring to here? He is not calling for ethnic purity here at this point, but he's warning against something uh, which was given as a warning to the nation of Israel from their inception, from the time that Moses led them out of Egypt and brought them to the edge of the promised land. He warned them that when they came into the land, they needed to be careful not to make alliances with the inhabitants there. They were to drive them out. And so the warning here is against infiltration, integration, and the influence of evil. There's probably no greater example of the infiltration and integration and influence of evil driving an individual away from the truth of God than that of King Solomon himself. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we read, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, the Hittites, and from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. 
For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. What a sad epitaph that is for a man to whom God gave more wisdom than any other or any before or after. Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon, we're all benefactors of the wisdom God brought in him and through him. And yet, in the latter stages of his life, it was through the alliances of these foreign nations that turned his own heart away from God. Chilling. Within the church today, we see a similar type of an alliance of weakness. We have, of course, what is referred to as the worldwide ecumenical movement. And it, of course, has many different definitions and applications. We, of course, see the mainline denominational churches trying to gather the free churches, the home Bible studies that have sprouted independently, and they're trying to draw them back under uh, the uh, oversight uh, and control of the denominational churches. Of course, the Reformation churches, those that uh, uh, historically come out of the Reformation, they're trying to gather together the, uh, the, de- the denominational type churches. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church is trying to gather together the Reformation churches. And on top of all of that, we have globalism itself is trying to gather all religions. You see, it's not simply uh, uh, as it were one fish uh, after another. It's a whole chain of events which ultimately leads to worldwide ecumenical uh, movement which is driving all religions Uh, into some type of common ground. We, of course, have seen in recent years a number of religious leaders who otherwise should have uh, not a lot in common. Uh, They don't even necessarily um, refer to the same God, let alone understandings uh, of their God. And yet they seem to share in this ecumenical movement a sense of commonality. We read from this article written in April 1988, which was called Earth Conference One, Sharing a Vision for Our Planet. We read within the back cover, they came from around the world, from parliament, senates, assemblies, from temples and churches and mosques. It was the first time that spiritual leaders and parliamentary leaders had come together to confront the threats of environmental crisis, nuclear war, famine, and disease. You see, one of the things that you will notice within the worldwide ecumenical movement is that if they can create some type of common cause and ground upon which we can all agree, then in the first instance, we can drive into the same congregation people who are otherwise opposed. But of course, it doesn't stay there in in globalism. This is globalism trying to swallow everybody together. We see in Assisi, Italy, Here's an article uh, that was written in January 24th, 2002, and it's concerning Assisi, Italy. It says, representatives included Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Shintoists, Sikhs, Jainists, tribal religions, uh, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Catholics, Baptists, Lutherans, Quakers, Mennonites, and Orthodox Christians. And of course, this gathering was was orchestrated by the Roman Catholic Church, gathering together the uh, religions, as it were, uh, under its wings. And so we see globalism trying to gather all world religions and world leaders. We see the Roman Catholic Church trying to gather together uh, the spurious types of, or and the other types of Christian uh, fellowships. And uh, so you see this happening all around the world. You also see the sense within the church and religion itself of what I call pragmatic political positioning. Here we see the Pope embracing Islam, kissing the Quran. We see him embracing Yasser Arafat, uh, an anti-Israel terrorist. Here's a picture of the Archbishop of the Church of England as he embraces Yasser Arafat, receiving an award from him. You see, the world is trying to embrace the church and the church is trying to embrace the world and trying to be swallowed up 
to the lowest common denominator. So not only are we looking at the broken cisterns, the places where the church has turned to, having turned away from the fountain of living waters, we've not only looked at the alliances of weakness, but now number three, we're going to look at the third cause for this decline, and it is sheep without shepherds. The historical parallel here we'll take from Hosea chapter 4. For in verse 6, again, Hosea prophesying over the northern tribes of Israel. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Chilling thought. Horrifying thought. Jeremiah, in chapter 23, writes, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. Again, Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. You know, when I see this historical pattern gone before us, and spoken of by both Hosea during the time of apostasy, in the northern nation of Israel, and then later as Jeremiah is prophesying over the nation of Judah. In both instances, notice the one that is being held accountable. As the sheep are being scattered, it is the shepherds that are being called to task, and they will be the ones that will be judged. I find it interesting because after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he meets Peter, you remember the conversation where he asks him three questions. And three times he asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. And, and, and Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. You know, that is an awesome responsibility. But that's why we are told uh, uh, Paul, in fact, tells us that we should not all seek to be a master, for they will seek, they will receive the greater condemnation. You see, false teachers were predicted by Jesus Christ that there would be false teachers that would come. In Matthew chapter 24, as he's there and over uh, the city of Jerusalem, there on the Mount of Olives, he begins his Olivet Discourse by saying, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Notice, many will come and say, I am the Christ. Now, they are not going to necessarily use the word Christ. The word Christ is Christos in the Greek, Mashiach in Hebrew. It means the anointed one. They will come and say, I am the anointed one. And notice what they will do. They will deceive many. False teachers are predicted by Paul. In Acts chapter 20, as Paul was meeting with the Ephesian elders, beginning in verse 26, we read, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves." Shocking, really, when you consider that Paul, having spent more than three years with that church in Ephesus, now has to go back and not only warn them that there would be wolves that would come and prey upon the flock, that's the obvious attacks, 
but that there would also be men who would rise up from among themselves and that their objective would be not to feed the flock and to drive them closer to Jesus and lead them into green pastures, but rather to make disciples after themselves. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There you see the, the, the cycle of deception that will continually grow worse and worse, Paul tells Timothy. Peter was also one who predicted false teachers in the end times. 2 Peter chapter 2, we read, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So, in the same way in which Jeremiah uh, pr predicted that these shepherds that led Israel as sheep away from the word of God and the counsel of God, so too Peter is predicting that as those false prophets led the people away and they experienced judgment, so too there will be false teachers that will arise and they will use covetousness to exploit them. They will use the greed of the people to draw them to their own words. And it's a, it's a strange feedback cycle that they will be involved in where their covetousness will draw them in and keep them in and make them dependent upon the teachings of the false teacher. Now, what are the characteristics of these false teachers? Well, the half-brother of Jesus, Jude, does an amazing job in his little epistle. In verse 3, he tells us what his original reason for writing, which we never get to. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the wind, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Now, what is disturbing about this these characteristics that Jude lays out before us here, is he begins by saying that these are not people who are a threat from without the church or outside the church. These are those who have crept in, notice, unknowingly. Remember Paul warned the Ephesian elders that there would be wolves that would come and try to ravage the sheep. That's the obvious threat but that there would also be those who would rise up from among them who would seek to make disciples after themselves. Here, Jude expands that to show us what kind of people these are. They are people who God says actually are mocking God. They come in the name of Jesus Christ, but they're actually mocking Jesus Christ because they are not carrying the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, 
Deception is the vehicle by which ultimately Satan can lead a person to a state of apostasy. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, we read, The coming of a lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Notice how often the senses of an individual is the vehicle through whom deception is able to reside and prosper. The idea that they are sensual, the idea that they have pleasure in unrighteousness, the sense that they are led about how they feel concerning something rather than the stability of an unchanging word of God. Notice what takes place here. They practice deception, and that deception leads them to a state of apostasy, even to the performing of signs and wonders. Oh, I've had so many people come to me and say, have you seen such and such? You know, it's a mighty work of God what's going on over there. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, of course, they'll, they'll, they'll want to tell you of all the, the uh, amazing signs and wonders. And, of course, what's important for us to recognize is signs and wonders, even in Scripture, are something that are not, uh, something that are only done by true believers of God. We see Moses and Aaron standing before Pharaoh, and his magicians also practiced signs and wonders. They were also able to duplicate some of the miracles uh, and signs and wonders that were wrought before them uh, as Aaron and Moses were there. And thus we also have, even in the New Testament, references to individuals. Simon, for example, an individual who we are told when Philip the Evangelist, one who previously waited tables in Jerusalem, went to Samaria, there was this man Simon who was there, who previously astonished the people, we are told, because he produced signs and wonders, so that the people said of him, this is the mighty power of God. You see, don't be fooled in isolation to the word of God, what the works of God are. We need to make sure that we understand that the works of God need to be in harmony with the Word of God. And that is, in fact, how we test the things of the Spirit. Paul, writing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears... They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You see that sense of the sensuality aspect of apostasy. Well, I feel this or I feel that. You need to appreciate the fact that our feelings are more often the source of deception in our life than a... A, a safeguard to leading us to truth. In fact, it was Jeremiah that says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so we need to be careful in this area that we don't allow ourselves to be led about by this sense of our own feelings. And, and, and here we see this prophecy of Paul where he says, there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. They just can't stand it anymore. In fact, what they really want is something that makes them happy, something that makes them excited, and not something that necessarily leads them to the foot of the cross, leads them to the narrow gate, takes them down the narrow way where they see the sense of self-sacrifice. Jesus, when he had uh, potential disciples approach him, he says, if any man... Come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, there's a sense of sacrifice associated with real discipleship. And the problem within many churches today is they seem to be more interested in gaining in numbers. So they are looking for conversions. 
But nowhere in Scripture are we told to make conversions. We are told to make disciples. Therein, we have the difference. We need to see that people are being discipled ultimately by Jesus Christ and growing into the grace and knowledge of Him, not some religious theme or idea or passing spiritual manifestation. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in his second epistle, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe he does a very nice job of summarizing some of the doctrines that are prevalent within those who have integrated the body of Christ uh, and influenced it. There in chapter 11, verse 3 of 2 Corinthians, we read, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You see, there I think he identifies the three main areas of what elsewhere Paul refers to as the doctrines of demons. There are many people who would use the name of Jesus with great affection. But the Jesus they are referring to is not the biblical Jesus of the Bible. And so, just because a person says, I love Jesus, I worship Jesus, uh, I read about Jesus, I love to hear about Jesus, you need to appreciate that there are many who use the name Jesus in a religious context who are not referring to the Jesus of the Bible. Here we are told that they not only will, will um, hear another gospel, or hear another Jesus, rather, but they'll receive another spirit. You know, we're told to test the spirits to see if they are of God. We're to test all things, hold fast to that which is true. And yet it almost seems in some circles that if you begin to ask questions about the manifestation of spiritual things, especially in what is supposed to be a Christian gathering, you're looked at as someone quenching the spirit. Well, here we're told that we need to be careful because there can be a different spirit. And certainly we see throughout Scripture many incidences where there is a different spirit at work which can produce lying signs and wonders. And of course, a different gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is very specific. It's very plain and it's very simple. And yet there are many who stray from it and they present a different gospel. Now at this point, I want to address something that is a natural question at this point, perhaps um, uh, residing in your mind. So who are these apostates? Are they Christians who have fallen away? Who are they? Well, let me try to address that, and I will give you my opinion. And, and please take it as that, that it is my opinion as to what I think these apostates, who they are, and, and uh, how they operate within the congregation and gathering of the church. And we see, so, uh, see uh, the example from uh, a parable given by Jesus Christ. The parable is recorded in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24, where we read, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest, 
And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. Now, as we look at that, in the context of what we've read concerning the infiltration of the church that is warned of by Jesus, by Paul, by Peter and Jude, we cannot help but, but see the parallel between this parable and the warnings given us that these are like the tares that are sown in by the enemy a tear is a wheat like plant but does not produce the fruit of wheat jesus in john chapter 15 made it clear that he is the vine we are the branches if we abide in him and his word abides in us we will produce fruit it's a natural byproduct of what we and who we are connected to. Here, Jesus uses an example of some infiltration that coexists with the wheat. And also notice in this passage that this infiltration comes by when the ones who are responsible for the field are asleep. And sadly, I believe that there are many who are in uh, places of leadership, occupying pulpits and lecterns and in the role of teachers who are asleep concerning the infiltration of tares, that is doctrine that is bad, and the people who bring them in. They're asleep, and so they come in and they begin to dwell together. Now, notice what Jesus says. Let them dwell together, all sorted out in the end. Now, what do we know about these apostates well again Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount beginning in verse 21 Jesus addresses in a very startling sort of a way what I believe is going to be his response to the cohabitation of apostates among real believers in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 he says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we're talking about people who name the name of Jesus Christ. They say, Lord, Lord. These are those who make a profession of faith but don't have a possession of faith in Luke chapter 13 beginning in verse 24 again Jesus says strive to enter through the narrow gate for many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying Lord Lord open for us and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to cry, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now in both Matthew chapter 7 and Luke 13, we see an identification of what I believe are the apostates. They are those like the tares among the wheat that coexist, creating influence within the church. Notice, they did not enter through the narrow gate. Of course, Jesus, recorded in John, uh, says that he is the door to the sheepfold and that no man uh, can, can enter in unless they go by him. He also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so he's the narrow gate. So notice who these people are who are making these statements. They are those who have not entered through the narrow gate, yet they cry, Lord, Lord. Their claim, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. In other words, they heard the truth. Elsewhere, notice uh, in Matthew's gospel, 
they make claims of doing miracles in his name. Yet, notice how Christ responds to them in both Matthew 7 and Luke 13. I tell you, I do not know you. Matthew, he says, I never knew you. So these are not believers who were born again, who fallen away, in my opinion. I believe they are those who have adopted the idea of integration, infiltration, and influence in the church. They are members of church organizations, but they are not members of the body of Christ. And they reside like the tares among the wheat. Now, what is the fruit of apostasy? Well, again, Paul tells Timothy, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Let's pause there for a moment. When we consider end times themes, the idea of perilous times, you know, we think of uh, global disasters, we think of uh, global war, uh, the one world government, uh, the Antichrist. But notice what Paul how what Paul lists as being associated with perilous times. He doesn't mention any of those things. He simply says, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Whoa! What an amazing warning Paul gives Timothy. But notice the attributes of these people. They are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They're those that have a form of godliness. That's why I think the parable in, in, in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares, is so appropriate to describe that type of infiltration and influence within the congregation of the church that we see as an indicator of end times influence, the apostasy. They have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And what are we told to do concerning those people? From such people turn away. For what do they do? They creep into houses and they make captives here of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away with various lusts, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What a chilling thought. But I hope you can understand that the purpose of this first study is to give us an understanding that I believe that the Bible speaks more in terms of our prophetic horizon, more about apostasy in the church as something that we should look and be aware of as an indication of the end times than any of the other. We should be focused on them. We should understand all the other aspects of, uh, and attributes associated with those other prophetic themes. But this is the one that actually affects the operation of the church within the world today the age of apostasy. Now in our next session, we'll look at the antidote for apostasy. And so I don't want you to leave here with a sense of depression thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I, I don't even know if I want to be in fellowship with anybody because I, I might be uh, uh, linking up with, with someone who, is, who has got some doctrine that's off or whatever. Hold on, wait until you hear part two and uh, put the two together. And so we'll look at, so what is the antidote? How can we be prepared to appropriately respond to that which is promised will be influential in the church during the last days? Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and grateful for the admonition that we receive from it. Thankful for the fact, Lord, that you don't leave us as children in darkness, but we are called to be children of the light. 
And thereby, Lord, we follow the lamp that is for us, your word, which is a light into our pathway. Lord, we thank you for it. Know that we are safe within the confines of following your word, being led and empowered by your spirit. For it's in the name of your Son we pray all of these things. Amen.